Well, today we're talking about common mistakes screwing watermelons because summer is right around the corner and what is better than a nice big juicy watermelon on that hot summer day. So we're talking about mistakes you can avoid. Welcome to the Road by Road Gardening Show, the best dead gum gardening show on the internet where we talk about gardening, a little bit of cooking, and growing your own food. Now sit back and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome. I'm Greg. I'm Sheila. And watermelons. We love to grow watermelons. Mm -hmm. We grow watermelons every year. A lot of people don't grow watermelons, so we're going to talk about common mistakes to avoid while you're growing your watermelons. Would you say the beginner gardener would be easy or hard? To grow watermelons? I think growing watermelons is one of those advanced things like corn to me. Yeah, I, I think uh, the beginner gardener, I can see where they would struggle with that just a little bit. We're going to help you with that today. But first, we've got some beautiful flowers here. Yeah, it's that time of year again. Mm -hmm. Everything is blooming. So where did you <laughs> where did you come up with all these? Because I didn't even know we had dahlias blooming. Dahlias are on a pot on the front porch. They come back every year. This white phlox I have out in one of my raised beds. Snaps, time of year for snaps. I've got them all over the place. And these yellow ones, I'm not sure what they are but they are in our wildflower garden. Yeah, so we have, uh, we planted some of our wildflower mix in an area out there that we kind of let go natural, and it is done exceptionally well. I need to do a little short video on, there, on that, showing how, how well it is done. We mow it once a year, mm -hmm. and it just blooms and keeps giving uh, all during the year. But I love this time of year. Well, all the way through the summer, I'll have flowers mm -hmm. in the house. Yep. And just, you know, walk through the yard, pick what's going on. Yep. So what would be, if we did a taste test today, uh -oh. what would be if we did a taste Here, test? Here, let me set them on this side. Okay. So uh, growing some heirloom collards in the garden, we got these Alabama Blues that we're growing, and we're growing right next to this cabbage collard. And both of these are rich in history. A lot of the old timers around in our neck of the woods talk about these cabbage collards. And then we have these Alabama blues that are actually stunning in color with this purple leaf mm -hmm. or, or veins in it. Mm -hmm. But are they any taste difference? Now they look differently. And uh, I would say as far as growing them, the cabbage collard probably got just a little bit more vigor, just a small amount more than the, the blue ones do. But you should have brought a leaf at each one. Well, we're showing here. Oh, okay. We're showing we're here what the pictures are, and uh, we're going to taste test them. Right. Are they any difference in the taste test of the two? And you prepared. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me different by looking at it? Yeah. You can. Now, you don't have to tell everybody how you prepared these. Can't tell I difference. can't tell any difference. No. Now this was two. Yeah. Okay, I know what that is. So you know which is which. Mm -hmm. And what what would collars be without cornbread? So we got some Jimmy Red cornbread that we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to partake in. Let's see if I get my knife up there. That's pretty. Did you do that this morning? Mm -hmm. And folks. If you never had Jimmy Red cornbread, you don't know what you're missing out on. There's your little small piece. And then I'm gonna get me a chunk of that right there. Uh, when the show's over with, we'll, uh, we'll have no trouble getting rid of the rest of this cornbread. Mm. Everybody jumps in on the cornbread. All right, so let's do a quick taste test right here. I don't I'll, know which I'll is you, which. You taste. Now, I can't, I can't look at it and tell any difference. Mm. Now this is number two. I've already tasted. I do believe they have more flavor than some of the newer varieties do. Or maybe in just the way you cook them. That there's a little stronger. This one, number two, is a little stronger. Very little taste difference, but this one appears to be just a little stronger. Mm -hmm. Should I do that again just to make sure? Yeah. Okay. In case y'all didn't know, that's some, uh, what is that right there? Pork chop. That's some pork chop left in there. Yeah. So I just boiled some pork chop. 
then sauteed the uh, collars down and then added some chicken broth and just let them wilt down. So can you tell the difference? I can. A little stronger right here. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not gonna say in a bad way, but it's a little more flavor, more a little more powerful than what that one is. Which one do you like the best? They're both good. I would say this one. I like this one the best. Do you? Mm -hmm. And which is which? That's the purple ones. Real. Mm -hmm. What are they called? Um, Alabama blues. Alabama blues, yeah. That's Alabama like blue, and it stands to reason Alabama blues got a little bit longer, stronger flavor to them than the cabbage collars. Cabbage collars are a little milder. Mm -hmm. And I really like these when I had just wilted them down just a little. They had a little crunch to them. They were, but to be fair, I cooked them all down the same. Did you taste the cornbread with it? No, but I, I can't get over the collars there. That's delicious. You want me to talk about watermelons? You mm -hmm. eat collars? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Woo, that's good. Mm. I could just eat the cornbread. I know. Look at that face. Look at that cornbread right there. See the red in there? Mm. That's that's delightful right there. All right, so let's move in some more things. You know, it's been kind of cool. I've noticed that we've had probably, seems to me a little cooler spring than normal. Mm -hmm. We've had some cool nights as of late, and some of the things have been struggling a little bit, but I think everything's gonna come through and move on. But it has been, the nights have really gotten us a little bit. Some of our things are, have not grained up like I thought they should have. You know, I've fertilized and fertilized my corn. It still doesn't have that quite green, green. color to it I want it to have. Now, I attribute that to some of the cooler weather. My, my peppers say. are like that. Yeah. Now, my tomatoes are green. Yep. So, uh, let's move in to mistakes people make growing watermelons because yeah. this is a huge issue right here. And um, we're going we're gonna to dig into the insect part of it, which is not much disease part of it the cultural problems with growing watermelons and all that. First thing let's look at is when would you want to plant watermelons? So one of the main mistakes that's made is they plant them at the wrong time. Yes. Oh, I <laughs> Go ahead. I catch myself Take just gravitating toward the collar there. Um, so healthy crop is, you want to know, you can't plant them when it's too cold. No, so this is, this is, this is my, for us in, in zone eight here, this is the way I do it here. Well, I grow my watermelons out as transplants. Now you can direct seed them on up and if you're planting a later crop into the summer, but that first, first spring crop, the one I always grow, I always grow transplants in the greenhouse and I transplant them out in the garden. It seems to work better that way. Normally speaking, it's gonna take you four weeks to grow out a watermelon transplant and that's from time of plant till it's ready to go into the ground. Now, for us is on eight here, the middle of March is probably the earliest you want to plant because we're still having some of those cool nights in. No danger of frost. No danger of frost. And we can have a little danger there at 15th of uh, mm. March. But if you want to get an early crop off, that's what you need to do. Now, to be safe, plant it sometime around the 1st of April. And I think everybody will be okay. You know, we had an early Easter this year. So uh, I planted mine, oh, I think I was the last week in March when I put mine out. When mine, did you put them in the greenhouse? Four weeks before that, which was uh, the end of February. I always plant my tomatoes and pepper first. I wait about 10 days and then I plant my watermelons. So what happens if you plant them too late, like in the middle of the summer? Well, you can have some problems with heat but uh, they've been people that has been more successful with them in the past. We normally have a hard time keeping everything growing on into July because it gets so hot and so dry here, the sun would actually just destroy them. So the reason we like to get them in early is because we like to get our watermelons off by the 4th of July. Now we may still have a, a few of them coming in around the 4th, but normally we won't Let's say the uh, the second week in July, we want to be through with the watermelons because mm -hmm. the sun just works on them so much. And it's hard to keep that vine healthy and growing to, prepare, to protect those watermelons and they get sun scald. 
So one thing about growing watermelons is, is the purpose of that vine there is to protect that watermelon. So we want to make sure we grow plenty of vine to protect that fruit from sun scald there. So back up here, zone eight, plant your watermelons in the greenhouse in in the February, plant them in the ground sometimes in April. Now, if you got, if, you, if that all that got by you and you still want to plant some watermelons, you can at this point in zone eight, direct seed them into the ground and be okay. You're gonna be a little bit behind that, but you'll still be fine. And we have charts on Hoss University. Um, if you go to our website and look at the Hoss University tab, we have growing guides and it will tell you for your zone the dates that you need to plant. Good reference there. Oh, that's good. All right, mistake number two, overcrowding. Mm -hmm. And I've been guilty of this before myself. Watermelons, because you plant that little bitty plant, and it's hard to plant them very far apart because mm -hmm. you just don't want all that bare dirt, but you don't realize how much those things are going to grow and how much vine you're going to have. So normally speaking, on your row spacing, that's how far apart your rows are, you want to go anywhere from four to six feet apart. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds like a lot, but, but when you grow those watermelons in, you'll realize why you put them that far apart. And in your row, how far your apart plants, plants in the row, you want to be anywhere from two to three feet. Now normally I will do two feet on my, uh, my row spacing. In how deep? I just plant them level. Now, watermelons is one of those things when you're doing transplants, unlike tomatoes, you want to plant those tomatoes deep. Watermelons, no, you want to plant them at soil level that they come out of the greenhouse. Now. And if you want some uh, results of overcrowding, if you plant them too close together. If you plant them too close together, then your plant your, your plant's going to compete with one another and you're going to end up with uh, Small fruit. Small fruit, and uh, you just not want to give your watermelons enough place to run. So you want to give them plenty of place to run. Spread so out. Spread out so they have plenty of vine to go. If you uh, if they get competing with one another out there, it's just not good. So to grow those big, nice watermelons, got to give them room. Okay. Third mistake is planting them in the wrong location. Mm-hmm. So watermelons do good in sandy type soils. You want your pH somewhere around 6.0 to 6.5, even on up to 6.8, you're okay. But sandy soils is what watermelons like. Watermelons do not like what we call wet feet. They don't want to be planted in a low area because one of the problems with watermelons is they're prone to disease. And anytime they have wet feet or they stay in a low area, they will, you know, diseases jump all over them. Sandy type soils, keep them a little bit on the dry side and you're better off. Full sun. Full sun. No Don't shade them whatsoever. In shade whatsoever. And add some good compost to that soil Good compost, you but sandy type soils, yep. They don't do as well in clay tighter type soils. When you say don't do as well, what? Disease. Disease. Yeah, they like the drain. They like to be able to drain out. Okay. And, and that's one reason drip tape works so good on it because we plant them on those well-drained soils but yet we can shoot water in there to them and, and quench that thirst that they have but the water gets on out of the way so that they don't uh, get those diseases okay next mistake is over water yeah you say watermelons they need all this water can you over water them yeah there's a fine line there so what happens is and it's not so much as the plants are growing, although we can have some disease problems there. With overwater, when those plants mature and those watermelons get big, if we get a lot of rain at that point, it causes them to blow up. <laughs> also causes them not to be as sweet. So, and there's not a lot we can do about it sometimes if we get a lot of rain when our watermelons are maturing. But the best case scenario is to have a dry year and have drip tape on them so you can give them a little bit of water when they need it but they don't have too much water when they're maturing out. They bust so open. always make a better water, a watermelon crop on a dry year than I do a wet year. Okay, what about the mistake of underwatering? Underwatering, then you're gonna stress that plant. You're not gonna have near as much fruit set or you're gonna have a really small size. It's gonna be stunted, stunted, fall off the vine. Mm -hmm. um, 
Number six. Yep. Lack of pollination. Bees, got to have bees for those watermelons. Watermelons are cucurbic and they got to be pollinated. So uh, we keep bees here because we have, we struggle a little bit with native pollinators. So we got a hive of bees here. If you do not have a real healthy native pollinators, definitely gonna need to get you some honey bees and put on them there to uh, pollinate them. Because if you don't have bees, you're gonna have misshaped fruit. We see that a lot, you know, where these mm -hmm. watermelons come off and they have that little, like like a squash Tail. almost, yeah. or they don't set fruit at all. Right. And yeah. they'll throw fruit off when they're real small there if they're not pollinated. Well, also the flowers will fall off, mm -hmm. the female flowers. Exactly. So you need those bees, or I guess you could self-pollinate them. I've yeah, seen people do I know. That. I've seen people do it too, but man, that's a lot of work for. And I normally plant a decent little spot of watermelon, so that's hard for me to do. So I don't self pollinate anything. I'm better off just give me a hive of bees, mm -hmm. let them do all the work for me. Number seven mistake mm -hmm. is fertilization not enough, not at the right time. Yeah. So we actually got a uh, a little graph here: rolls of nutrients by melon growth stage that we're going to put up there and uh, and go over some of this. Now, at pre-planting, I got this actually off the of Oklahoma University website, which was very good, I thought. We're going to tweak it a little bit, but at pre-planting there, I would recommend using our complete organic fertilizer, which is a complete fertilizer there. But it also, from their website, calls for calcium, boron, zinc, manganese, and all those things, which is in our microboost. So what I normally recommend is putting that complete organic down as a pre-plant, maybe a week to 10 days before plant. And just as soon as that plant starts growing, whether you transplant it or you direct seed it, hit it with some micro boost. And then we get to the vegetative growth stage. Now the vegetative growth stage, let me get my, you're going to need potassium, magnesium, uh, all those calcium, you can need that calcium again. Boron is really important for mm -hmm. watermelon production. And boron is one of those things that's included in our micro boost, as is sulfur. Sulfur is also important. So you have all those micronutrients that are important for that vegetative state. What we're trying to do there is build all that vine up. And then we move to the flowering stage. And at the flower stage, that's when we start putting on that fruit. We need potassium phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, boron, and zinc. And zinc, again, is in that uh, micro boost there, and manganese. And then at fruit set, of course, nitrogen and potassium, calcium, magnesium, and boron. All those help finish out that fruit to make a nice watermelon there. Now, what I recommend is because we need calcium. Calcium builds cell wall in watermelon and to have a nice healthy watermelon that's got a good thick rind, we need calcium. So I recommend using the 20-20-20 and the injector because we got drip tape down because drip tape is important for watermelons because they are hard to irrigate with a sprinkler. Once those vines run everywhere there, it's hard to get in there and move those sprinklers around. So we got drip tape that we're putting right underneath where the root system is. We're not wetting that leaf causing disease problems. So we're injecting our fertility into our watermelons. Alternating the 20-20-20, which is our balanced fertilizer, gives us our nitrous, phosphorus, and potassium. And then we're using the micro boost at the same time to give us all our micronutrients. Now, that being said, every other time that we feed these plants, we're going to not use the 20-20-20, but use calcium nitrate along with micro boost. And that covers all those elements that we just mentioned here in this guide right here. So that's a pretty simple way to do it. Start out with your complete organic pre-plant, then move into injecting your 20-20-20 micro boost, alternate it with calcium nitrate micro boost, but boom, boom. you give that plant and everything And where's that chart from? Oklahoma State, but we're gonna put it up there on the screen right here where everybody can see it right there. It's good information. All right. And next, you wanna talk about disease? Yeah, so this is the thing, and this is one of those weird things. Watermelons don't have a lot of insect pressure. But they do have a lot of disease pressure. And uh, diseases can be what gets you on watermelons. 
from a home garden standpoint, the very best thing you can do is to make sure that you've not planted a watermelon or a cucumber there for the last three or four years. To be on a three to four year rotation is going to help you a lot with these diseases. I'm having a little issues here. Yep. <laughs> Get messy in it. Mm -hmm. Another thing too is sanitation, and this is where the uh, the uh, no-till thing kind of comes into place here. We want good sanitation because we don't want any leaf residue that's left out there in the garden. It's going to harbor those diseases. It's going to move into the watermelons. So make sure that your soil is worked up good, that you've harrowed or you've tilled all the old vegetative material into the soil there so that everything's nice and clean. So three years crop rotation? Three to four years, three or four years. for no cucurbits. So no pumpkins, no cucumbers, none of that for three to four years. Wow. And that's the reason around here that all the old timers love to plant watermelons on new ground because of the disease um. pressure. All right, site selection, we went over that a while ago, a good pH 6.0, 6.8, full sun there. Uh, and now use disease resistant varieties. Some of our older varieties that we just love, and I can think of the one that my granddaddy grew was a Congo variety. Mm -hmm. They have very little disease resistance. So we have some newer ones nowadays that have disease resistance and those would be yellow doll and sangria. When you, you say disease, what type of diseases? Oh, we got all kinds of pieces. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, anthracnose, gummy stem blight, alternaria, all those. There's a bunch of them. I'm going to go over just a second. Okay. So the two disease-resistant varieties I recommend is yellow doll and sangria. And if you want to grow a regular red-meated watermelon, there is no better one out there in my book than sangria. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind. Plant those and those will help you directly. All right. So what do you do from a spraying standpoint there to keep... Uh, these diseases that bathe in your watermelons. All right, we're gonna show this up here on the screen right here, and I'm gonna go over this as we go through it real quick. These are some disease uh, pesticides that you can spray on there, some fungicides you can spray on there to help with these particular problems. And I'm gonna name out these common problems that we have with watermelons. All right, liquid cop, you apply that every seven to, six, seven to 10 days, and you would spray this for alternary leaf spot, anthracnose, downy mildew, gummy stem blight. You don't hear nothing but mm -hmm. watermelons on this right here. Powder mildew and bacteria fruit, fruit blotch. Fungamax. Blotch. Every 14 days. And you want to use that for powdery mildew. Well, now you may say, well, why do I want to use liquid cop works on powdery mildew and so does fungamax. It helps with these fungus fungicides if you rotate so they don't build up resistance there. So Fungamax, you can spray over 14 days for powdered mildew. And then the next one is Garden Foss, which is a phosphorus product. Spray over seven to 10 days for gummy stem blight, powdery mildew, anthracnose, downy mildew, and alternaria leaf blight. And then we have the vegetable fruit, flower, and ornamental fungicide which is a chlorothionyl product, and this can be used for anthracnose, downy mildew, target spot, which is a new one to me, gummy stem blight, alternaria, and then scab and powdery mildew. And last but not least is our complete disease control that can be used for powdery mildew, leaf spots, anthracnose, and gray mold. So you have all these tools at your disposal here to stay on a little bit of a program there for disease, but the Best thing is crop rotation. Crop rotation. Crop rotation. And you know what? It can be a little bit intimidating to grow watermelons, but that gum it's worth it. All right. What do we not enjoy them every year? We have we a tree. We put them underneath a the shade tree and just eat four watermelons and give them away. So we just enjoy them. And I would highly encourage you if you've never grown four to grow them. Now they do vine and you need a decent amount of area to put them in. So uh, try to try to you know at least grow you a twenty by twenty spot up. When it comes time to harvest them, that's another mistake you can make. Another mistake everybody makes. It's made. nothing worse than going out there, cutting that watermelon open and it's pink. Yep. So we got a video on YouTube. That you can go watch this right here. But these, I want there's a caveat to it. You normally always go with what we call the curly cue on the, and that's right above where the stem is 
that's about two inches from where the stem goes into the watermelon, is this little thing, this like a pigtail. We call it the curlicue. Tendril. Tendril or curlicue. When that tendril dries up all the way back to the stem, normally speaking, that means that watermelon is ripe. However, your very first ones may not be. They work, that's a real good indicator once you get a week to two weeks into your harvest. For those first couple that get ready, you may want to give them an extra few days on that or you're going to be cutting agree. up a yeah. green watermelon. And that's really frustrating it when is. you waste a watermelon. <laughs> so when that stem dries up on your very first ones, give it an extra three or four or five days. And then after that, you can use that curly cue as a pretty good indicator to... Uh, Right. And if you're in the grocery store, a good way is to look at the belly. Cream colored belly spot. Or you, you can look at that out in the field too, because in the field it's going to be more whitish. Yeah. If it's not ready, and then once it gets ready, it's going to be more of a yellow, creamier belly. Now some people say they can thump it. Yeah. Until, I've never been able to do that. My so. granddad used to thump it. He said he could. He said he could. <laughs> could he really do it though? Well, he did it. <laughs> I mean, whether it worked he, or not, he was messing with y'all. Yeah. You get up there and you listen yeah. and thump it yeah. and pat it. Listen for that hollow, yeah. hollow sound. Yeah. All right, so there we have watermelon mistakes growing guide. Maybe that'll help you not to make any of the mistakes that we just went over out there, and you can probably be successful growing you some nice big old juicy watermelons. Mm, right. I think I like that better. Now, you could have changed your mind. I have changed my mind. Yep. It's a little more flavorful. Yeah, it's got a different... I, I like that better. Yeah, it's a little It's a little more flavorful. Now, if you're not a collard fan at all, I would say probably go with this one because it's more mellow. Mm. But to have the real good... That, that Alabama blue was, is pretty awesome. All right. Yep. Garden Spotlight. This was sent in to us by David Well... W-E-I-L-N-A-U. I'm not going to butcher that name. Zone 9 in Rockledge, Florida. Zone 9. And he has sent us pictures of some collards, some kale, some lettuce, and tomatoes, and green beans. Look at those tomatoes. I wonder if those are this year's tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Kale and lettuce. And when I was looking up your address, David, I see where you ordered some corn and sunflowers last week. So I bet he's got some corn in the ground I'm going sure right now. So if you want to send us your photos for Garden Spotlight, there's a place under the Hulsh University link to submit your photos and we will show them on the air. Go ahead with a corny joke. Was it a watermelon corny joke? Yes. Okay. And if, if you don't get the first one, I may have another one. All right. You ready? I'm, I do not have a good track record. No. Why are watermelons such good gossips? Because they have tendrils? I don't know. They have all the juice. Oh. All the juice. Why did the watermelon go crazy? He lost his rind. <laughs> Can you add one more? Uh, yeah, one more. One more? Okay. What do you call a melon that commits a crime? A water felon. <laughs> I couldn't decide which one to use. Those are all good. And they were all good. All right, we got the old goat. Old goat drawing to do. Old goat somewhere on the set. If you find him, put in the comments below where you found the old goat at. And it's not the guy sitting beside me here. And we will send you a coveted prize. All right, so let's see who this week's winner is. And it is Daniel Harbin. Daniel, congratulations on finding the old goat. Send us your address at CustServeHossTools.com and we'll get you a prize sent out. And we've got one more yes. giveaway. So giveaway. we just started this last week, but Monterey, which is a brand we sell, was nice enough to offer us to do a giveaway 
on the show every week of this little combo pack right here. And this is what you saw about putting on watermelons. It is. It is. So we've got a horticultural oil right here that you can spray on about any soft body insect right there. And you know what's neat about this right here? This right here you can spray any time of the day. It doesn't matter. We have a complete disease control here that you can spray as a foliar application or you can put it as a drench. And it also works on a, good, a lot of diseases for tomatoes. And then we have fish and guano, which is a natural fertilizer right here. Can you put that in your injector? I don't know that you could. I, that's a good question. I had a though. few questions about that this week. We put, no, I normally put it in my water can in water. That's mm -hmm. the way I do it right there. I had said no, because it might stop up the filter. And we have the yellow sticky traps. And these sticky traps can be used both ways. You can use these for monitoring what, monitoring what pest you may have or use them as a control thing to catch insects so that you can keep their populations in check. So thanks to Monterey for providing this right here. We'll send this out every week. And the winner from last week the is... The winner from last week is... Matt Douglas, Johnsonville, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So Matt, you also need to send us your uh, shipping address to CustomerHostools.com and we'll get this sent out to you. I think he's a customer. I think we can find him. You think we can find him? Yeah. Okay. All right, so to be able to... to in the drawing to win this right here for next week for next week you need to comment in the comments below and every week it's going to be something different last week it was where are you from this week it's going to be what is say? your favorite watermelon to eat to grow what is your favorite variety yeah variety watermelon. Yep. so put that in the comments below if you don't have one just pick one and you will be put into the drawing for this great little monterey uh, set right here that's going to fix you up and get you started with disease control, fertilization, insect control, and monitoring there. How about that? Right. Ba-boom. Ba-boom. All right, folks. Hope you enjoyed it. We've enjoyed it as well. We're going to dig into some of this cornbread and these collards right here. I can't wait. Thank you for joining us. Now it's time for you to get off that couch and get outside and get dirty.